That's wasn't a, wasn't a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. So it's twelve forty. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome um, to another day, day two of DataCon LA twenty twenty one. My name is Courtney Fowler, and I'm joined by my co-host Morali, and of course our presenter Allison Bruce. Um, Morali and I will be moderating the chat and Q and A during the session, and we'll be making sure that during our session track um, that. <clears throat> everything can be running correctly. So um, I'll go ahead and do a short introduction of Allison. <clears throat> Allison has been working with Starbucks for a bit now. She is working as a data and UX designer for them. Um, and for our data track, she'll be going through what data can design can learn from each other. And without further ado, I'll go and hand off to you, Allison. Hi guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Courtney and Morali for the introduction. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. One second, please. Okay. So uh, thank you guys so much for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here. I was an attendee the past two years, so it's a super cool opportunity for me to be participating in Datacon as a speaker this year. Um, so I just wanted to start off with a quick disclaimer. Uh, my presentation is completely independent of my work at Starbucks. Um, okay, so for today's agenda, we're going to start out by uh, with why I'm talking about this topic. We're going to refine that by stating the objective and the goal of this lecture, touch on the scope of this talk, address the burning question of what data and design can learn from each other, uh, answer that in three parts with examples, and then we'll summarize what we learned uh, with a concluding statement and then finish off some actionable takeaways, and then we'll have our Q&A. Okay, so why I'm doing this. Uh, I went from being a UX designer to studying data science, where I held a few analytical roles, and now I'm in a position where I'm a data-aware uh, UX product designer. Uh, so, so, so from transitioning between both fields, it taught me about the processes each follow and how closely they relate to each other. So today I'm gonna be talking to you about what I believe they can learn from each other, and more specifically, ways they can help each other build the end best products. So that said, the objective of today's lecture is to understand how to build the best data products based on the relationship between design and data. With the goal of you walking away from this lecture with actionable insights related to design and data that can help you improve your product. So let's narrow that scope a bit and question, well, what do you mean when you say design and data? So these fields are broad in nature, and today we'll be discussing how data um, and design relate to each other in terms of the responsibilities held um, by these fields. So for example, in data science, we have roles such as the data scientist, an analyst, or an engineer. And in product design, we see roles such as a product designer, a UX, UI designer, and product managers. Okay, so the burning question, uh, what, uh, what can data and design learn from each other? So uh, data and design both share the goal of communicating value to their users, and they can learn from each other how to better communicate that value to their users. So this is important because communicating the value to the user is the basis of great effective products and great effective solutions. Okay, so let's break this into three main parts. So first, let's refresh the basis of these fields by briefly touching on the processes they follow and how they reach their respective goals. So first, we start off with the scientific method, which is a step-by-step -step iterative process, iterative in terms of if the hypothesis is incorrect, of analysis with the goal of validating our hypothesis based on the value from the data we extract. Okay, so what does that mean and what are data science people actually doing here? So they're using this process of analysis to pull value from structured and unstructured data. They organize it, they figure out the different variables, uh, how they relate to each other. Then they fit the data accordingly with a testing and training model. Um, and they do this to tell us what's happening and then they build different types of predictive models to determine what can happen next. So conversely, in design thinking, it's a step-by-step -step iterative process, but of synthesis, and it's based on empathizing with the user. 
So while there's different layers to this, applying design thinking isn't just about making it pretty, it's about using beauty to make usefulness out of a product. Okay, so synthesis and design tells us why and what are our designers actually doing with applying design thinking. So they're using this process of synthesis to understand why something is happening and they build an experience and a product to communicate to users how to do something while making sure the entire time throughout the entire user's experience that the user understands why. Okay, so this brings us to two. Now that we've defined the approaches of both fields, let's discuss how they come together. So they intersect in three different ways. Uh, data awareness, data visualization, um, and then being data informed. So this graph depicts the density of the reliance on data to inform a solution or make a decision about the product. Um, in this graph specifically, data driven being the most dense or the most strongly reliant. Okay, so let's start with the most narrow approach, data driven. For a problem to have a data-driven solution, the problem must be known in, in its entirety. The goal has to be obvious and the questions and methods must be ambiguous. While unlikely 100% of the time, realistically speaking, this can still happen. We can still have data-driven solutions. But we're talking about designing solutions for products used by people. And this is what presents a great deal of misunderstanding because while problems can be driven by data, solutions necessarily aren't. So now let's evaluate um, the next step um, a little bit more or a little bit less dense and what it means to be data informed. So data informed is when we're using multiple research methods or various types of data sources to come up with an appropriate response or solution. So what's important to note here is that the solution we create from being data informed is to stem from a specific research method or a specific data set. So another way to put this, is we'd say, okay, so if the data says X, the interviewer say Y, let's invite a new method that blends both the views. And so while this may sound good in theory, because we're saying, hey, look, we're good. We're addressing elements from both the scientific method and design thinking. Um, let's not forget the possibility of triangulation, which is when we pull confounding factors that actually influence our independent and dependent variables, causing a spurious association. Okay, cool, but what's the point? We don't wanna prove our point so badly that we bring in concrete evidence that counteracts or misrepresents our initial core information. Alas, we reach data awareness, which is our perfect blend between design thinking and the scientific method. Uh, perhaps you didn't expect this, um, given the visualization I chose, see the power of the way that we communicate our visuals. Anyway, uh, data awareness is when we swap ideas between the scientific method and design thinking and consider them equally valuable. So the key parts we're discussing in to, with to data awareness today as it relates to our topic scope is one, when we apply design thinking to the data collection process, like asking why and empathizing with uh, the source of our data um, in the very beginning during our exploratory data analysis. Um, and two, designing the UI and leveraging the user experience of our products to best communicate to our users how their actions are impacting the product in its entirety. So really on this, like, what does that mean? So think about a time when you entered information in a product um, and you knew it was incorrectly formatted. And you also knew that when you fixed it, it was being received by a system that would result in a certain output. For example, your food was delivered to you successfully. Okay, so let's look um, at an exploratory data, specifically the exploratory data analysis of a data science example, and then let's exercise some data awareness thinking from both a product design and a data perspective. Okay, so there's a student, he's learning data science in a boot camp, and he's doing his final data science capstone project. He's looking to make predictions about injury collisions in Seattle and begins to perform an exploratory data analysis, uh, otherwise referred to as an EDA. Uh, side note, the student's name is Kai and he actually wrote a book called Data Persuasion where I sourced part of this example. And the book is great, you should totally read it. Um, okay, going back to our example, um, the student pulls government data he found on a website about collision reports and he uses some code during what we call the exploratory data analysis using Python in his development environment, such as like a Jupyter notebook. 
he generates this map of Seattle, which shows him a count sum of the total number of accidents in certain zones in the Seattle area. He then closely sees that the majority of accidents collisions are located in downtown Seattle. Actually, there's two times the amount in downtown Seattle as the other points um, outlaid on the graph. He then uses the Pearson correlation to analyze a relationship between the sum of these variables, and he sees that there may be a correlation between one car and either a pedestrian or a cyclist. He then decides to dig deeper and hone in on the correlation between these two variables by individual neighborhood. Perhaps we could have a better analysis of what's going on in the collisions in this area if he focuses on one individual neighborhood at a time. But then he hits a snafu uh, and, and looking for more precise location data, uh, all relative data he seems to be able to pull about collisions in these specific neighborhoods or the specific area uh, during this specific time window is a list of incomplete, non-properly formatted street addresses and the longitude and latitude. Ugh, what a pain. What is he going to do? He attempts using REGIS. Uh, which is a library that um, helps with mapping location points to various map zones. And he tries to use it to help him structure the data um, into neighborhoods. But he can't get it to work. Uh, he is a beginning student after all in a boot camp, right? So he ends up going through this super tedious process of manually setting boundaries on the longitude and latitude that are provided to define the neighborhood zones in order to group each accident record um, with a particular neighborhood. Okay, so let's go back. There's two data aware opportunities we can discuss here from both a product design and a data science uh, perspective. Okay, so part one, applying design to data. So going back to the point where the where the student first analyzes the relationship between variables. Um, in order for him to narrow his scope, he decides to ask where instead of asking why. So in some cases, um, it could be premature to ask uh, why, which is true, but in this case, not really. So let's apply um, our data aware design mentality here and explore how this process could have been, could have been improved for this student had he asked why. So instead of purely relying on the data, which we know is being data driven, or relying on alternative data sources, which we know is being data informed, he could have conducted user research to determine why. How could he have done this? Well, he could have figured out a way to find people to tell him more about the neighborhoods. Maybe even those people would know about map sources um, that are otherwise difficult to find or that he couldn't find in the first place. And then maybe he could even take it one step further and ask those people about traffic accidents in said neighborhoods. And maybe this could have changed the type of data the, the student was trying to analyze in the first place, all because he asked why. And again, asking why is applying data or design thinking to the scientific process or the scientific method. Okay, so then let's look at part two of this. So perhaps the data could have been better uh, to begin with where the data set actually was provided um, and it showed the neighborhood already. So how would that have been possible from a data aware product design perspective? Um, and this would have been a designer's uh, choice. So see, this isn't really the, the student's fault. Um, by following a data-driven and data-informed approach, he's just following the scientific method, what he, which is he's taught to do, right? Um, so we can't expect only experienced data scientists and analysts to want to analyze our data, which presents a design opportunity for the origin of the data. And let's consider that it's a that the origin of the data is a product in it of itself that is designed by a designer. And here it seems that it could probably do its job better. So how is a designer going to figure this out and know the downstream effects of, of the product? Um, well, they could have gotten to know their different types of users better. Um, so welcome the idea of different types of personas. So perhaps the designer could have conducted user research and interviews that informed him that the people entering the names of the streets also already know the neighborhood names. And if the UI could have had a spot for them to enter that information, then those data entry people would have done that. Conversely, what if they didn't know? How would we solve this? Well. If the user has to enter a street address anyway, perhaps we can use our UI to kind of, you know, 
uh, force the user to enter a valid street address in the entry field before they can move on to the next field or click submit. This way, perhaps the back end, the back end can do the heavy lifting of associating a neighborhood to the entered address and then auto complete the neighborhood field. Um, otherwise, the designer could create a data persona. So as a designer, you don't just know, uh, don't just base your UI and your overall user experience on your primary users, your primary users being the people that enter the data into this product you're designing, but consider the downstream effects um, and your downstream users. So the data scientists and the analysts here, because they're the ones who are gonna be using this data to inform big decisions and then predict future behaviors. So either of these implementations would have increased the product value um, and from multiple and then complete user journey perspectives. So what's the bottom line here? Uh, two things. One, ask why, like we do in design thinking during the um, EDA process to help you with your data wrangling. And then from a design perspective, designers apply design awareness using the research techniques you know um, to, like, to accommodate for uh, not just direct users, but indirect users um, through creating a data persona. Okay, so then that takes us to part three. So now that we've discussed the process of each field, we've narrowed in on the levels of integration of each field, let's discuss data visualization, which is the ultimate intersection of data and design. So let's begin by um, answering the question, what is data visualization? So data visualization is a representation of information or data that is intended to communicate value by highlighting particular insights. Data visualization is data driven by nature and sometimes data informed. It depends on the purpose of the, of the visualization um, and the variety of the data sources we're using, of course. But let's discuss that in more detail and observe it uh, from a different lens. Okay, so first let's note that data visualization has been used for centuries to effectively convey insights that have been saving people's lives. So let's start by looking at one of my favorite examples. So Florence Nightingale is one of the most promised statisticians in history, and she used her passion for statistics to save lives of soldiers during the Crimean War. So Nightingale traveled to a military hospital in Turkey um, in 1856, and the hospital was enveloped in extremely grim circumstances. And she came to observe that the poor sanitation practices were the main culprit of the high mortality rates in these hospitals. So she was determined to curb such avoidable deaths. So she started out by collecting data and recording things like the cause of casualty, the conditions surrounding it, and the date. She then created um, what has come to be known one of the most famous infographics in statistics and data visualization, which is the Coxcomb, as it was named, which made a case for eliminating the practices that contributed to the unsafe and um, an unhealthy environment. To do this, she, used, she utilized color coding, shading, proportion to highlight the cause of deaths per month. And then she presented this to the, to the decision makers in charge of these conditions in the hospital who understood from the infographic that the cause of deaths was more so from a sanitation condition of the facility rather from actual war. So they started practicing more sanitation efforts like cleaning medical supplies, changing out bed sheets, et cetera. And pretty quickly they started seeing that there were less insects and vermin present. And eventually there were considerably less deaths. So her graphic piloted efforts that saved people's lives. And this demonstrates the level of impact and the power of data visualization. But we live in a world of big data now where there's a bunch of different types of data and mediums to tell the story. So the method and the medium that we choose are very important. Let's explore this thought with the work of Frank Ansicombe. He's best known for one of, the be one of the most famous examples in data visualization, which is referred to as Ansicombe's Quartet, which he created in 1973. So in summary, he visualized the differences when plotting data with the same statistical properties. In this case, these four different data sets, yes, they only had 11 points each, but they all shared the same mean and variance. So they were practically identical, statistically speaking. So he plotted them under the same conditions and they ended up coming out like this, which all look completely different. And importantly here, almost statistically identical I, statistically identical data sets look like they're communicating completely different things. And that's just based around the way that they were plotted. 
So what does this mean? Each data set is different in nature and we should plot it according to what we're trying to convey. So this brings up the influence of design. So recall in data aware design, we're asking why um, in order to start this process in the first place. And we're also wondering, we're empathizing. We're wondering who are we making this for so that we can inform the most uh, appropriate representation of the data and insights we're trying to convey. And yes, this is an example of a small data set in comparison to the big data in today's world that we're referring to and dealing with. But let's consider this as a template of opportunity of the variations of data that we have. If this can occur in such a small data set, imagine what can be displayed in a massive data set. Okay, so how can this be applied to the workflow in data science now? So data visualization in data science. Okay, well, let's first off start off by addressing what data scientists, for example, are doing here. So in data science, we have these packages we download um, in Python called libraries, a couple examples being matplotlib and Seaborn. We use little code, we pop in our data and boom, graph. Okay, great. Uh, what an effective way to generate a representation of our graph that we can so quickly communicate these findings to our business stakeholders for. But wait a second, is this really the most effective way that you can communicate the value of your work to the decision makers in your audience? Is this graph really going to help you save time in the long run? Looking at this graph, what can we really understand from it at first glance in the first place? But we're analysts and we're data scientists, right? We don't care about things being beautiful. We don't have time for that. The purpose is to be scientific, right? Maybe not actually, because design uses beauty to be scientific. And if you want to go into a rabbit hole about this, I recommend checking out Edward Tufte or Nadia Bremer, um, who have a lot of thorough analysis books and workshops on this subject in particular. But what we're talking about is when we utilize the beauty of design, so specifically here, pre-attentive measures such as color, nice labeling, text variation, line width, you can save time in the long run because your data visualizations will be so strong. And by strong, I mean it presents information and it affords for the user to explore that information that you won't have time um, that you won't have to spend extra time verbally communicating what your visualization itself is meant to communicate. Okay, so let's explore that a little bit further. So let's start out by considering your audience and what you're trying to communicate to them, which is in essence data or design. Uh, let's evaluate how you're delivering this information to them. Is this something you're going to present in a deck? Is this in a one sheet? Does it need to be flexible to both being received static with minimal text in an email that probably isn't read at all, but it also has to be discussed in a boardroom in a presentation? Uh, how we design our graphic is based on these considerations too. So what are a couple of ways we can do this? Well, the true iterative designer way would be to sketch out your ideas on paper, start with grayscale, and then gradually use pre-attentive measures to signify or afford for the certain understandings, then test it with a potential user, and then iterate it. If it doesn't work, try it again. When you do this, you get something like the graph you see here. Look in the very right uh, where the arrow is pointing. You can see how much easier the graph to the far right is to uh, decipher what we're trying to address in this information as opposed to the left. Again, this is all the same data. We're just displaying it differently. Okay, so, but we're analysts, we're data scientists, we're coders. How do we code this? Well, let's repurpose our previous graph and make it a little bit easier to understand for our audience and thus more valuable with a little code. Okay, so just by adding a few tweaks in our code, so see the arrows signifying the changes we made um, on the right, which really isn't that substantial of heavy lifting for increasing the value of our work, we did the following things. We increased the opacity of the fill, which helps us differentiate the data endpoints, which is what we care about from the rest of the data. We made the trend line thicker for emphasis. We changed the line color to be less jarring, so it's easier to spend time evaluating a graph when the color isn't so sharp or jarring. Um, we added more ticks to the x-axis, which paints um, a more detailed picture of the story. And then we changed fonts of the textiles, which make them easier to read. Okay, so how can data, visual data visualization be applied to the work of our designers, creating our interface and mapping out our user experience? 
Well, let's first consider that while contrary to our previous examples, it's also important to note that data visualization isn't just a graph. It's information that's delivered in a particular way. So reflect back to our initial definition of data visualization, which says that data visualization is a representation of data that is meant to highlight certain insights. That's it. So that said, those certain insights very well may be most effectively highlighted in a table or comprised in a structured list. That said, let's look at an example that highlights insights non-graphically and in a user interface. Okay, so let's say you're a designer responsible for um, using the interface you design to communicate the value of numerical data in a card in an application you're designing. And you're tasked with presenting numerical value of several data points, some of which are null in the database. Recall that null values are blank fields in our data. Our job as a designer is to communicate and display as much relevant information to our user that allows them to accomplish their goal. But let's say you're not a data aware designer and you weren't aware of the nature and behavior of your data, the fact that it contained null values when you were designing your user interface. So you go forth with your design and you don't realize that there's null values in your data set. You design the car for the interface and suddenly you go to get ready for a user test. You view the link, um, you click on the link of the current demo in production and then you see that your card looks like this. Uh Oh, this looks like a mistake. Your users can't see this. this um, they'll think this is a bug or a glitch or an issue with the system. Perhaps this will even diminish the credibility of the display of other data points in our interface. So then you say, okay, it's a null, which means it's nothing. So nothing is zero. So we'll just make it a zero. Well, wait a second. Data point C is a zero in nature. So how will your user know the difference between a true value of zero and when the field is actually just missing data? Uh, they won't, that's impossible. So then let's say, uh, so then you say, okay, then we'll just leave it blank. It's blank in the data set, so it'll be blank in the interface. That way the user can see the zero, and if it's a blank value, it's blank in the UI. It's consistent, we've achieved our goal, right? But is it though? When we look at this, it's a visually acceptable from a UI perspective. It doesn't look horrible when it's left blank. But what about from a user experience perspective? We're neglecting to tell our user why it's blank and we're expecting them to understand why. That's not optimal UX. Moreover, uh, what, what does leaving this value blank say? Could this also be interpreted as an error or even worse, the user wonders why it's blank. The purpose of our jobs as designers is not to assume our users know anything and to best communicate the, the most relevant information that helps our users accomplish their goals. So when we get back to the drawing board and we create our final design, we use a dash to represent that there are no, vi no values, aka null values for this field. We test this uh, to make sure and our users understand the point of our dashes. Fantastic, success. So what's the point being that if our designers understood the data, how it behaves, and we practice data aware design, we'd save more time in the long run and for our engineers, which in, in respect, it saves the company's money and it makes a better product to begin with. Okay, so in summary, what did we learn today? So three things. Uh, one, that when we apply design thinking in data aware design, we can alleviate data wrangling or the data aggregation process. Um, two, uh, we build the most effective products when our designers understand the data and how it behaves. And three, the purpose of design and data visualization is to best communicate the value of intended insights. Beauty in design can be scientific. Okay, so you may be wondering, this is great, but how do I apply this to my job? Let's break this into three parts. Okay, so consider the emphasis, uh, consider emphasizing are empathizing with the source of your data during uh, your data munging, munging or your data collection process. Explore customizations in your code when creating a data visualization. So go beyond matplotlib and Seaborn's um, default settings. And then perhaps you can grayscale your data visualization, then test it before presenting it. And that's what you can do as um, a data scientist or if you're in a data field. So what if you are a product designer or within the product space? So perhaps create a data persona. You probably have more than one variation of a primary user and should accommodate your design for that. 
and question how your product could change based on the data. You should also establish a relationship with data analysts to pull information that will help you understand and use your data in your design process. And then from a business perspective, let's consider the requirements that you're asking of your team. Consider the product you're developing and how you can best utilize the integration of these three fields. Uh, these are the sources that I used for this presentation. Uh, thank you very much. And does anybody have any questions? Yeah, so we'll just go ahead and got another about 10 minutes or so left. Uh, Allison, thank you for your presentation. It was actually, um, when you mentioned Edward Tufti, I was like, hey, finally, a uh, book I've read and someone I'm really familiar with, too. So I'm um, definitely glad you kind of hit a couple of points that are kind of near and dear to me, too. So, uh, Morali, have you seen any um, questions come into the queue that we can review? No, I have not seen any questions um, come through. But that said, um, Allison, people may have questions at a lot of point in time, so they may reach out to you. Uh, through this hop in app while this conference lasts or or any other um, you know email or whatever you have posted people may will reach out to you uh, but great presentation uh, you know it, it's it's really conceptually data meets design to make um, you know make these visualizations uh, very uh, as I always say you know data driven or outcome driven and that's where the value is and and, and very nicely, uh, you put it. Uh, I have one question. Could you please tell us what you do at Starbucks, please? Um, so uh, my role at Starbucks uh, is a data UX designer or an overall like uh, product designer. But the basis of this presentation is not on or reflective of that work. So I can't talk about uh, that. <laughs> It looks like we, yeah, that was from Mark's question. So got that taken care of, Mark. Um, I do have a question, Allison. Uh, I think you mentioned one book earlier um, as far as a great resource, right? Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, book resources that you can recommend as far as like further reading on how you can kind of uh, mix data and design of better communicating information and insight? Um, sure. So it's interesting because it, I'm from the conversations I've had, the webinars and workshops I've attended, um, the books I've read, it's the intersection between the two is starting to become what seems more of like a hot topic. Um, and I'm even talking with my uh, or fellow UX designers. Um, I taught uh, several classes as a um, as a UX design instructor with General Assembly and still um, am connected with a lot of my students. I've even in, in communicate or still networking with them, they even talk about how their jobs are based around um, designing products on behalf of data. And, you know, we're exchanging resources uh, in order for them to best do their jobs. So I think if you're a UX designer, I would definitely, or a product designer, um, it's worth your while to, uh, you know, find more resources about data and design. But back, Courtney, to your question to begin with. Um, so, okay, my uh, Cole Newsom Newsom Bomber Sprouse Bruce. She is. Um, she works at Google, and she wrote this. She wrote two books actually. The first is called Storytelling with Data. The second is more of like a. Um, she has workshops too, and, and goes to conferences. Uh, but her book is. Uh, a great read has a bunch of different examples and then her second book is more of like um a a workbook in order to like practice like what she teaches you in the first book um and that i would highly recommend whether you're from a you know coming from a data perspective or from a design perspective it teaches you so much about um how to make effective data visualizations and i would say the biggest takeaway that I use to this day of this book is that um, that when you're making data visualizations, obviously you need to understand your data. Like if it's, it has negative values, then you can't use a pie chart because how are you going to put a negative value in a pie in a pie chart, right? And he actually, she actually says you shouldn't really use any charts that have dessert or food names. Um, that's like another thing. Um, but the point being is that understanding your data is what um, and how it behaves, whether it's categorical or numerical, is uh, 
first understanding that is really important so that you can use the best visualization um, to communicate the value and the insights that you're trying to communicate to, to your audience. And the most effective way to do that is whether you're coding this, whether you are, you know, drawing this on a piece of paper is start with grayscale and then just build from there. And we're kind of borrowing that mentality from design thinking in the first place where, you know, in design, we have our low fidelity or we sketch on a piece of paper and then we have our low fidelity and then we have our medium fidelity, our high fidelity and we iterate. So just applying that design iterative uh, grayscale mentality um, should be should makes your data visualizations more effective because when you apply when you start with grayscale all that your user is focused on is the functionality they're not distracted by i don't like this text i don't like this color or whatever so you can just test the functionality and then when you start to realize okay wait i need to draw attention to like this point here and i want to not really draw attention to this point down here okay so what are different ways you can do that um so cole knew some Nussbaumer Sprouse talks about the use of pre-attentive measures, um, such as like line thickness or color um, or shapes in general, and then use those gradually in a step-by-step -step process to draw attention to certain points. Um, and then by doing this in like layers and in phases, yeah, uh, yes, Courtney, thank you for posting it. Doing this in layer layers or phases, you're able to make for the most effective design um, because you have vetted each each phase of the process and you know, okay, this works, this just proves this point. Instead of just like starting out with like, there's color and there's black and there's this, and there, you know, all over the place. Uh, we, that's just your draw, every use of like a bold or a text variation or a color or a shape draws attention to something. So when you have attention drawing things all over your screen, how do you know what to focus on? And that is kind of the point that this uh, design approach, um, this iterative design grayscale approach applies to data visualization that I think should be implemented to make better solutions and project design. So. Great, Allison. Yeah, I have at least three more questions. Oh, cool. Um, so for designers, could you share why, how you went into learning data science? Uh, sure. So I uh, I was a UX, uh, UI designer for like three or four years, four years and in New York. And then um, when I was, there were certain products that I was designing that were based on data. And there's one product in particular when I worked for this music company and the entire basis of this application was data visualization. And it was my responsibility to communicate um, data, like, communicate like massive amounts of data to the people using this interface with, uh, you know, tables, graphics, et cetera. And so I just kind of jumped in to like trying and playing around with data visualization. Um, and there was issues with the way I was doing it. I didn't know, like, I didn't know what I was doing uh, cause I hadn't studied it. And uh, I made mistakes in the, in my graphics. And then I found out later, oh wait, I can't have this type of, I can't have a bar graph. This has a negative value. This, I can't, this doesn't work. So now I have to go back and redesign it and then work with the, you know, engineer and we're going to fix it. And, but I only have this amount of space on the page. So what are you going to do? So, um, so it's instances like that. And then I, as I worked in jobs after that, there was more products that were being built that were completely based around data and everyone was talking about it. And I just didn't really understand it. So, um, I decided that in a lot of designers, you know, when you're talking about upping your career and learning more and being a better designer, a lot of them are going to front end engineering. And I thought at the time that like data science, which is this field that I could learn to better understand the data, which is what I was designing for. Um, if I learned it, I could make the best products possible. So I actually learned data science to be a better product designer. Um, but yeah. Okay, that was the question from Cervantes Lee. So next question from Kira Kuznetsova or Kuznetso. Uh, this is a question for everybody. What can you recommend for those of us who are trying to enter the field of analytics? Um, you don't need, okay. So it's a very uh, competitive field, I'll say that. And it's difficult getting a job um, as an analyst when you're a boot camp student. And I say that as someone who took five <laughs> boot camps, 
and changed their career kind of twice or three times. Um, a lot of, it's very common to have a computer science degree and then an engineering degree to liter to be like a business intelligence analyst. And getting that job is very difficult when you're a bootcamp student, but it's not impossible. Um, and getting into analytics, I guess it depends to what extent, right? Like, are you coming from a design perspective? Are you just enhancing your career? You can take part-time courses. You can watch um, YouTube videos. I'm a big fan of doing that. Um, and then you find out little influencers in like data analytics and data visualization. And then like, for example, I taught myself Tableau through YouTube. Um, and I just watched this video like 10 times. And then I recreated what the guy was doing in the video. And then all of a sudden I had this skill and then I was able to apply it. And then doing that changes the way that I design interfaces that hold data because I'm like, I know the process that it goes through. So if I'm designing an interface that holds, you know, has an iframe, it holds a Tableau visual, right? I know like, you know, what happens if the data does this or this or this. So I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, yeah. No, 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 that's good because you've touched boot on bootcamp. And last question I'll try to get in from okay. Anand Ranganathan. How do we know that a dash is better than leaving the value blank? Uh, that's a great question. So I pulled that example from an example I actually used in working in one of my experiences. Um, and it depends on user testing, right? That's the that's the user experience answer. So you can't know if it's effective unless you test it. In this case, I came up with all these different ways and then I tested them and then the users understood what that dash represented. So perhaps that was, you know, because of other uh, fields in the data um, or other fields in the interface that were displayed that way. Um, whatever the reason is, they understood that. And so that's why I used it. So, but the point being is that if you understand um, the merit of each value of your data, you understand how it looks and how it behaves, then you um, can best accommodate for how to design a solution, but know that you can't complete or have a valid solution without testing it. So test it and then you know if it works and if it doesn't, you try again. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. Uh, Courtney, take it over. Okay. Should I stop? Allison, appreciate everything. Morali, appreciate your co-hosting. Uh, session guests, I appreciate you guys all for attending today. Um, I think we're at time now, so I'm going to ask you guys if you can please take part in our survey, see how the session was, anything we can make better, change, or something you did like, right? Um, and Allison, again, we appreciate everything you've done today for the presentation. If you guys have any additional questions for Allison, feel free to reach out to her on the um, Hop in app. It can be easily accessible to kind of go in and chat her up and see whatever other insights you may have to um, data and design and also any other recommendations as far as training or any other reading material. Um, and with that, guys, um, have a great day and good rest of your day. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Thank you guys.